Good evening, everyone. Um, my good friend Jeremiah was kind enough to ask me to record a video of my testimony to send him, and so I'm going to do the best I can. Um, my life started in Miami, Florida. I was a newborn baby when I was born. <laughs> back in 1968 <clears throat> and um, we lived there for about three years my dad worked for Pan Am some of you may be old enough to remember that airline it used to be um, America's flagship airline it represented us to the rest of the world but they had been headquartered in Miami they decided to move their headquarters to New York and so they laid off a bunch of people including my dad who was a mechanic so we moved to Central Florida and we lived there from when I was three until I was about nine. And those were some really good formative years because it was kind of a small, small town called Fruitland Park. And it was kind of a little sleepy little Florida town where um, it had a strong sense of community. We uh, went to a church in Leesburg, which is right beside Fruitland Park and considerably larger town, but not, not that, you know, not a huge city. And... Um, so we, we had a lot of friends, we made a lot of friends in church. And I went to kindergarten and elementary school up, up through fourth grade, or third grade, I'm sorry, up through third grade at, um, in Freeland Park. And I can remember um, liking other boys all the way back to like first, second grade, first grade. I didn't really know why or, I mean, I just simply liked them. I wanted to be their friend. I, they just uh, had an effect on me. They, I was drawn to them. So, you know, this continued uh, throughout school. We, uh, we left Florida <clears throat> when I was nine. We moved to the town that I live in now. Um, with my brother. I've lived here just over a year now in Powder Springs, Georgia. And um, I'm only about five minutes from the house I grew up in. And I continued to um, like other boys here and there, either at church or at school. We went to a church about 15 minutes from here for many years. I was always a high moraled kid. I, I didn't want to do any bad stuff. I didn't want to drink or drugs or sleep. Or, I didn't want to do all the stuff that the bad kids were doing. And I actually prided myself. I, I You know, I was immature and I was self-righteous and judgmental, which is a sign of immaturity. So, um, yeah, I just said, I'm not doing what those bad kids are doing. I'm, You know, I was pretty much an introvert and I was pretty much an indoor child. Um... You know, when the other kids were out playing in the streets or whatever, I was playing video games or watching TV or reading the encyclopedias, that kind of thing. And um, so throughout into my young adulthood, I still maintained this attitude that I was just, okay, I, I do feel drawn to other guys, but I know it's a sin to act on that. So I'm not going to do it. And um, I don't really have a strong desire to have an intimate relationship with a female either. So I guess I'll just, God just wants me to be single and celibate my whole life. I've got the gift of singleness, you know, which I have heard people talk about. Well, something happened when I was in my mid twenties, something that something was America online. And that something was the internet being opened up to the masses. And when that happened, it, my friend Stephen says it opened up a a super highway to sin because it really did. Um, sadly, I was sort of sucked down a, down a road that had I been more had I been stronger in my faith, I would have avoided that. But you know, I started meeting people who were like me and who thought it was okay to be like me. They thought God was okay with it, or some of them didn't believe in God. But, um, you know, and it was very enticing to meet people like that. It was very um, alluring. And 
and I felt affirmed, you know, because I, I had this conflict, you know, I have these desires, but I can't act on them. It's wrong. No, Lord, help me not. But when I started meeting people online and sadly, I started downloading pornography also because it's right there. You don't have to go to a, you don't have to go to a certain store or a certain part of town to find it. It's just right there in the comfort of your own home. So I started looking at stuff I shouldn't have looked at. I started going places online I should not have gone. And uh, throughout my 20s, the rest of my 20s, I was still pretty much celibate, except in here. I wasn't celibate in here anymore. Um, and that, that was until the age of 29 when I finally moved out of my mom's house into a little apartment nearby. And it's kind of like, uh, that was when I decided it's time to start sowing my wild oats and see what, see all the fun I was missing out on. You know, um, sin is very enticing. Sin, sin looks good, it feels good, but ultimately it leads to destruction or at least certainly to you realizing that that's not what life is about. Um, so yeah, I began to invite people over. I'd go to other people's houses and we would uh, do things. And eventually, I once, like I said, once I moved out of mom's house and she couldn't move over my shoulder, look over my shoulder, I started going into Midtown Atlanta and going to bars and stuff. And if you're familiar with Atlanta, uh, it's known as the San Francisco of the South. It, there's a very large uh, homosexual uh, community in Atlanta, very, very large. And so, yeah, I made a lot of friends and I got a lot of affirmation it's okay to be what I was. And, uh, I, you know, a lot of my friends were good, good friends, but you see, we all had that one thing in common. We all liked the same body parts. And, um, that was what we had in common, which I now found out later that that's not the thing that you should have in common with people. Um, so, over the years, um, I continued to just live a double life. I had my family life over here and my church life, and then I had my gay life over here, my social life and my sex life or whatever, they were over here. Um, and it remained that way all the way up until 2009, two things happened. I met a young man who ended up coming to live with me. His name was Devin. And, um, I also discovered a church that was gay affirming and I started attending that church in Atlanta. And I felt at home there. I mean, the pastor said, hey, it's okay. You can live that life and be a good Christian. And, you know, I'm not gonna say anything negative about him. I'm sure he's sincere, but I now believe he's wrong. Um, so I went there for a couple of years. Uh, my friend lived with me from 2009 until 2013. And one of the things I did was I began inviting him over to family activities. And it was for two reasons. One, I wanted him to have a good family life because he came from a bad childhood, very sad, bad childhood. And I wanted to be able to bring somebody with me because up until that point, I didn't really have anybody. I'd have to come by myself. My siblings would be, bring their significant others and I had to go by myself. So it was kind of nice to have somebody to bring with me. Now, of course, my friend didn't really fit in, didn't really feel comfortable. And he'd always say, <laughs> he'd say, you wanna leave? Can we leave now? <laughs> he'd always do that. And I'd say, yeah, we can leave. So anyway, he lived with me for uh, over four years uh, and it was good and it was bad. We had good times and bad. He had a lot of problems and issues, and I was still very, I was still a carnal Christian at that time. I was very carnal, and I, I didn't know how to handle him. I didn't know how to deal with him, really. So one night in December of 2013, only a couple of weeks after his 24th birthday, um, he wanted to go out on the town with some friends, um, a couple of people we barely knew, really. And I was more than happy to let him because I wanted a break. <laughs> you know, I wanted the house to myself that night. And so I said, yeah, go have fun, go have fun, go have fun. Well, um, 
something happened. He, he began drinking, and that was always an issue with him. He began drinking, and he got into an argument with them, and he called me at early morning, at one or two in the morning, to come get him. And so I was committed to him. I mean, we were pretty much platonic, to be honest with you. But I still loved him in a, um, what's the word, uh, in it just in a, as a friend. I still loved him. And so I got up, got dressed, and got in my car, started heading down to Atlanta to go find to go pick him up. And I called him, I talked to him on the way down, and I said, where are you? I'm coming to get you, where are you? He said, I don't know. But he was in the car with those people. And I spoke to the girl that was driving. She s insisted on bringing him home. Even though he was begging to be let out, she just would not let him out. So at one point I was told he uh, apparently pulled the parking brake, jumped out of the car, and this was on Interstate 285, which is the perimeter highway around Atlanta. And it's a, it's a road I do not like. I try to avoid it if I can. Um, it's the heavy traffic all the time almost. And uh, of course it was the road that he died on. And every time I, plus, I pass that place in the road where he died, uh, I, I, I can't help but feel a little sad. <clears throat> so anyway, finally I get a call from them saying that he had jumped out of the car and gotten hit. I said, what, where is he, where are you? And they couldn't tell me where they were. So I drove back and forth on 285 several times. I kept driving by blue lights and I did not make the connection that the blue lights were there for him. Until finally I said, okay, let me get behind one of these police cars and find out what's going on. And uh, the officer comes to my window, may I help you, sir? I said, yeah, I was told that my friend jumped out of a car and got hit. Uh, can, you, can you help me? And he said, stay right there. <clears throat> stay right there, I'll have someone come talk to you. So, um, Thankfully, my best friend at the time just happened to live nearby. And I called him and he came to, to there to be with me. And so when that, when that officer, a female police officer got in the car and said, uh, you have my condolences, he was there with me when she told me that he, had, that he had passed. And of course I broke down, I lost it. And my, my best friend was really good to me. He um, insisted that I stay at his house that night and, he ended up um, doing a real good job coming up with a wedding, a funeral program, excuse me, and uh, he officiated the funeral. He was a really good friend to me. And um, so you would think that something like that happening, maybe that would be a wake up call that I need to get right with God. Well, unfortunately, that still took a few more years. Um, you know, I. I started with the post office in 1998, and I'm just about right at my 25th anniversary now. Um, I'd never really had any coworkers that I was attracted to or drawn to. They were just, you know, people. They were other people like me. In 2017, a young man came to the post office who I just immediately was drawn to. And I'm now realizing that when that happens, it brings out my parental side. It may not have any kids. I meet someone like that. It just, um, it brings out that side in me, the dad in me, I guess. And so I wanted to be his friend. And um, eventually, over a period of months, I became friends with him. And I even introduced him to my friends. And he became part of my social circle for the better part of a year. And then he started to change. Uh, he started to get uh, cold, uh, standoffish and cold. And um, I don't know why. I didn't know what I had done. I, I didn't allow myself to think any dirty thoughts about him. I didn't I didn't want to be that kind of friend. I, would, I wanted to be like a dad. And so I, I didn't understand what I did. Um, finally, in February of 2019, he, I guess, I kept trying to be his friend, and I guess he got tired of it. So in February of 2019, he went and filed a complaint against me with uh, postal management. And when he did that, it was like someone had taken a knife and shoved it into my chest. It hurts so bad. And the natural impulse is to want to hurt the person back, but um, 
thankfully I did the right thing, which is to turn to God and ask for help. Um, and it took a while. God did begin to work on me. He began to work on me. He began to get me right. He began to show me my sin. And he began to convince me that I needed to get out of it. I needed to leave that life. And like I said, it wasn't overnight. It mainly throughout 2020, 2021. But he began to bring new people into my life. New people that, that I would eventually become friends with. I discovered Kent Hovind in, sometime in 2020. And uh, he began to minister to me through his teachings. He straightened me up on a lot of my theology that was wrong. Um, and I've always loved music. So in 2020, God also introduced me to a Christian singing group called the Three Heath Brothers. And they began to minister to me in song. And they also brought out my dad's side. <laughs> And um, I, I finally got, in May of 21, I went to Dinosaur Adventureland for the first time and met Kent Hovind in person. In that same month, I also met the Three Heath Brothers in person for the first time. They were at Dollywood. And I finally, I began my actual friendship with them. It started in May of 21. And um, so, you know, God continued to, 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 bring me out of the old life into the new life during that time. I also reconnected with an old friend in 2020 who I'd gone to that gay affirming church with. And he and I were both at the same point in our lives where we were deciding that that kind of life is not right. God doesn't want us to live that way. And so he and I kind of ministered to each other, encouraged each other. Um, well, he got, he told me about a church that he was going to. And he said, I love this church. You need to come try it out. I, and I said, and at that time, I had not been in church in a long time. And so I was out of the habit. And I said, Martin, when, when you, you know, I'll go with you one day. I'll go with you one day. Well, he got deathly ill in the fall of 2020. and was in the hospital for a long time. Almost died. And when he started getting better, I said, Martin, when you can go to church again, I'll go with you. And finally, he was able to start going back. He, he's a, he was a very talented flute player and he used to get up and play the flute both at the old church and at the new and he he was very good at that and we sure do miss his flute playing now but um i started to go to that church uh it's now called livingstone church the pastor grant cole is an awesome guy he's got an awesome testimony he had used to be a drug dealer at one time and he got saved out of that and this is my pastor's auto autobiography into the darkness and out into the light. One man's journey. Um, highly recommend that book. It's a very riveting story. God continued to work on me. I continued to move out of that old life. In June of 22, well, in April of 22, um, my friend that was living with me got violent with me one night and I had to have the police called on him. But that was sort of like a moment when I said, okay, I'd been thinking about moving in with my brother. My brother lived by himself in a three bedroom, two bath house, and he was struggling financially. Wasn't making as much money as he had used to make. And I had a mountain of credit card debt. And plus I had a history of taking people in to stay with me. Um, just they'd stay for months at a time, maybe a year. One, one, one friend stayed with me for a year. And I would just enable them. The one friend that stayed with me in 2016, he wasn't making any progress in life because I was enabling him. I bought him cigarettes. I bought him wine. I, I took him to dinner. I, you know, he, so he just basically vegetated that whole year, you know, because of me, the way I didn't make him do anything, you know? And so, um, that was happening again with this other friend. Um, and so I, I finally had to put, I had to in that pattern of me taking people in and enabling them. So in June of last year, a little over a year ago, I sold my condo and moved here. And um, in 2022, something else happened. I met a young man through my friend that was living with me. He was having a, he had a severe alcohol problem. But because I was going to that church that my friend Martin had introduced me to, I knew about a recovery program called Soul Changers Recovery Program. Um, very good program. I highly recommend it because they do more than just get you clean physically. They help you get right with God spiritually. And that's what's really important. 
you know, I would not recommend anything but a program like this because what's the point in getting clean when you're not getting right with God? You may as well stay a junkie, right? So that this this program helps you get right with God and get clean. And super that that young man came and stayed with me for a few days until Jake, uh, my friend, got tired of him and told him he had to leave. So he went back to this place that he was staying at. Super Bowl Sunday of 2022 which just happened to be, I, I realized this later, three years exactly after my coworkers filed that complaint. It's as if God had spent three years getting me ready to meet this young man so that I could be the friend that he needed me to be. Now, the old Ryan, I would have enabled, I, yeah, you want something to drink? Here, I'll give you some drink. But I couldn't be like that anymore. That's, that's the old Ryan, the new Ryan. Um... I had to be the friend that this young man needed for me to be. And so I went to go pick him up, Super Bowl Sunday, uh, 2022. He even has the date he got it tattooed on him. And that's why it's so special to him and me. Um, I, I was gonna take him to the Super Bowl game at my friend's house, my best friend's house. And he was wasted. And he said, he got in my car and threw up on himself. I said, I can't take you like this. He said, will you take me to the hospital? I said, sure, I will. So I took him to the hospital, and that began his road to recovery. He was in detox for a week. And then I imme immediately, I was able to help him get into Soul Changers. And he is a transformed life. He's now one of the leaders in the program. He leads Bible studies. He's considered an elder. And I'm so happy to, to, that God used me in his life to do something positive when in the past I wasn't being a positive influence on young men. I was not, but I want to be now from now on. And so, um, you know, in, in fall of 22, God introduced me to another wonderful Christian singing family called the Family Sal. And they bring out the dad in me. <laughs> and they're just wonderful, wonderful family. And they happen to live in Knoxville you know, right by, right by you, Jeremiah. <laughs> um, just a coincidence, I guess, but a good coincidence. And so I've become friends with them also. Very good family. Just an inspiration. I, I love seeing young people that love the Lord like you do. I love seeing young people like the Sows and the Heaths that, that love, that want to serve the Lord. Most young people, they want to serve themselves, but not them. And that's that inspires me. And I want to support and, and be a friend to people like that, that love the Lord. But um, one thing that I had to learn coming up to 2023, just recently, I realized that when it came to my coworker, I did do something wrong. I didn't think so for a long time, but I realized I did do something wrong and God had to show me in a very miraculous way, what I, the sin that I committed. It was the sin of idolatry. And I only realized this very recently. You see, many years ago, not long after I left the post office, started with the post office, I bought a little figurine of a mailman and some other little postal decor items because you know, I'm, I'm a decor kind of guy, you know, <laughs> knickknacks and everything. So... I put, I bought this thing, like I said, 20 some odd years ago, put it on a shelf and never paid much attention to it. But just recently, something told me to look at the face really good. And so I did. <laughs> and it blew my mind. It has his face on it. The coworker that God used to begin my sanctification, to chasten me, to hurt me, it looks just like him. And I was I thought it might be crazy, so I took a picture of it and I showed other people that know him, coworkers. And I said, Am I just seeing things or does this look like who I think it looks like? And they said, Yeah, that's him, all right. Oh my gosh. One one coworker said he gave her goosebumps. And uh I only, I did one little thing to it to make it look closer to him. I put a little dab of brown paint on his chin because he has a little beard right here. 
That's all I did. Um, and and what what God was showing me was, no, I didn't I didn't allow myself to think lustful thoughts about him, but I did something else. I made him into an idol. I made him number one in my heart. And you know, lost people do that all the time, because if you don't worship the true God, you're going to worship something else, right? Uh, so they make all kinds of things into idols. But Christians aren't supposed to do that. Jesus is supposed to be number one in our hearts all, at all times. We have to always ask ourselves, okay, am I liking this person or this thing more than Jesus? Then I need to be careful. I need to be careful. And, and uh, over four years, I didn't know that I had committed idolatry until God gave me a little idol <laughs> to show me that I was. And... Um, so that little guy is going to be part of my testimony from now on, just like the, the real version of it is going to be my part of my testimony. Um, you know, I have a friend who, uh, who had an idol in the form of the Florida Gators and God gave him a vision one time and said, um, you know, you've got an idol and it's like, it's a, it's an alligator <laughs> it's a football team. And so I've had to be real careful. You know, I love the Clemson Tigers. I'm a Clemson Tiger fan, but I can't, I can't love them too much. And just recently, when I was visiting Dinosaur Adventureland, something, uh, God brought something to my attention and said, you know what, you had another idol, and I had to smash it. And uh, I was like, you're right, I did. Um, my last car before this one was a beautiful orange, fire orange, they called it, uh, Kia Forte. It was a, it was a top of the line Forte that you could get in 2019. It had all the bells and whistles. And it being orange, I would put my Clemson stuff on there, and I just love my little Clemson car. And one year, uh, back in uh, in September of 21, on my way back from seeing the Heath brothers in Asheville, I went through Clemson and I gave it a little photo shoot in front of the Memorial Stadium and in front of Dobbs Hall. And it's, oh, look, I gave it a little photo shoot. Oh, my little Clemson car at Clemson. <laughs> And the funny thing is, not long after that, my friend who was staying with me got drunk one night. I was in bed. I was in bed with his little dog next to me. Thankfully, he wasn't with my friend. I had his little dog next to me. I wake up at 1230 in the, at, at night or something like that. And I said, so I go downstairs and I say, where, where is he? he? He'd gone out to dinner with a couple of friends that night. And I knew he was drinking, but they were driving. So I wasn't worried. And I start hearing this moaning and groaning from the backyard. And I'm like, what's going on? So I go to the door, I open the door, and there's my friend limping towards the house with a bloody leg. And he says, oh, help me. I'm like, what happened? What did you do? So he said, I don't know. You don't know? I, so I got him in the house and I looked at his knee and it was busted wide open. And I said, I gotta cut, we gotta get you to the hospital. I gotta call 911. He said, no, I'll get in trouble. I'm on probation. I'm like, I don't care about that. Your leg needs immediate <laughs> medical care. And so I called 911. They came and they got him, took him away. And about this time, right after this, the one of the friends that he was with, the one that drove him home, called me and she said, Ryan, um, Jake, he went off in your car and drove it to the park and I had to leave, I couldn't stay. I'm like, what? So I look out the window into the parking spot where my car was supposed to be and it was gone. And I said, oh no. And so I threw on some clothes. It was a cold, wet night in January, cold and wet. And uh, so I go out the back and my condo was located right next to a city park, like 30 second walk away from it. It was really nice to have there. Um, so I walked over there and I look in the parking lot, I start looking for my car. I don't see it in the parking lot, but I see a couple of blue lights over in the corner. I said, well, you gotta see what they know, if they know anything. And I, I walk up to one of the police vehicles and the officer rolls down the window and he says, sir, are you looking for your car? I said, yeah. And he said, is that it over there? He points into the woods. <laughs> and my car is upside down in the woods. I said, yeah, that's my car. He said, do you know what happened? I said, I was told that my friend went off in it and 
drove it over here and he's I just I just sent him off to the hospital I just called 911 he's he's on his way to the hospital and so he said well I know it's nasty out here I'll give you a police report and you can call the insurance company tomorrow and thankfully everything went smoothly the insurance company did cover it and I'm so happy and I was given another car a new car which I I, I know that this was God because my newer car was roomier it was a crossover vehicle and God knew that I would need it to move with in a few months um, later on that year. And it also is a hybrid, so it gets very good gas mileage. And God knew that I'd be taking road trips in it. And um, so, yeah, that um, I realized when I was at Dinosaur Adventureland that I'd made that little orange car into an idol. And so this new car, I like it, but I don't love it too much. It's a thing. That's all it is. I need to learn that. I used to love things way too much, and I used to love, um, I've, I've learned that. So God has really brought me a long way. Right now, um, I've been introduced to a new ministry <laughs> that happens to be located at a church right down the street from where I work. It's called Proud to be Delivered, and it's a ministry that ministers to homosexuals that either that want to leave that life or have left that life as a support for them. And... I saw their banner on the side of their church. It was a big rainbow flag. And I was driving home one day and I saw it and I said, oh, pride flag, I don't need that. And then I looked again and it said, proud to be delivered. And it was a seven color flag. And I said, oh. <laughs> so uh, this past Sunday after I left my church, I went over to that church, which was literally on the way home. And I went into the lobby, the, the service was ongoing. and. Um, I spoke to a guy in the lobby and I said, uh, I saw your banner out there and I'm very interested in that ministry. Is there anyone I can talk to? And he said, I'll go get you somebody. So he went and got a young man who came out and met with me. And I'd already been to the website, proudtobedelivered.com. Just remember that. And I'd filled out my information and I started talking to him. He said, are you the one that works for the Postal Service? I said, yeah. Yeah. And he said, I tried to call you yesterday. I said, Really? So I looked at my recent phone calls, and there he was. And I said, I thought it was a telemarketer. I'm so <laughs> but he said, I'm just about to give my my testimony right now. I'm getting ready to go on stage. You want to come in here? And I said, sure. And so I went in there and heard his testimony, and then I heard the pastor. The name of the church is Worship with Wonders, and it's literally right down the street from where I work. And um, I, I just, I, I think the Lord showed me. Um, I already had a passion for creation science, defending biblical science. That's why I support uh, Kent Hovind's ministry. And believe it or not, five minutes from here is Creation Ministries International. And I support them also. Creation.com, that's their website. And literally like five minutes down the road. So I go in there and visit them on my off day. I bring them stuff. But this is a second ministry I think God wants me to be a part of. Helping to minister to people who want to leave that sinful life. So um, I'm excited about the future. I think God has great plans for me. And there's, I'll tell you, living for God and being in his will and doing what he wants you to do is the best feeling in the world. Better than I ever felt when I was living for me. And I recommend to anybody, Jesus is number one. He is the best. Living for him is the best thing you can do. And it's the most rewarding thing you can do. And I now know that.